All right. Uh, nice to be here today as a visitor instead of a participant in council. It's a little shorter that way. Um, <clears throat> I get to go home when this is over. Anyhow, um, so today I'm going to update you on what the uh, Genomics and Society Working Group has been doing uh, for the last year. And um, uh, just showing you who the membership is and uh, point out that um, we have Amy uh, McGuire is a member of council and she's on it, and Artie Rye, who I, I don't see, so she must not have made it to the meeting this time. But also to point out um, the uh, website, so you can also go there and get more information about who we are and what the meetings are uh, and uh, the various activities that we've undertaken. What I want to talk about today, we've been very active uh, since the last time I came in to talk. Um, so I'm going to try to focus in on three of the more uh, major issues that we've addressed. Uh, we've looked a lot at the ELSI program and uh, some uh, more briefly, uh, we considered some issues about the SEER, the S-E-I-R, there of course have to be two, two things that sound like SEER in the same field. Um, but this is the study section that came about in 2011 and that uh, reviews both ELSI and research ethics uh, PAs. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the relationship between the LC research program and, and the division. Uh, all right, so uh, we spent a lot of time on this boundary issue. And um, to give a little bit of background, it is important in the LC community because uh, LC, the field was invented by LC. And so it, uh, it emerges and it changed over time. And because of that, there's, I think, a little more debate, or, or maybe it's the same in every field, but there's a debate over what the boundaries are, what are the limits, what counts as LC research. Uh, and in part, it's hard to answer that because LC is creating the boundaries as they are enforcing them. So there was nothing in particular that was, uh, that motivated this concern. It's more that it is a perennial concern and because we have a new division, it seemed appropriate to review some of the more, um, uh, some, of the, some of the boundaries that people were a little bit more concerned about. So one of them is called single disease. That's just a phrase and what that means is that there has been a hesitation or less support in the LC, uh, in, by LC staff to fund uh, proposals that come in and say we're going to look at LC issues in a single disease in Alzheimer's or autism or, or colon cancer um, and uh, some people have disagreed they've said well if that's really the best way to study something then why exactly uh, well, you know it, it seems like an odd prohibition and what was interesting in the conversation was that it was very clarifying because LC staff was able to explain that there really isn't a single prohibition against this sort of research it's more a question of generalizability. And if you have a study on a single uh, topic, you're less likely. It has a higher bar, basically, to, to pass. So the idea, the recommendation was to maintain the limit, but to clarify the, the language. Non-medical issues came up, uh, and that's things like forensic testing, direct-to-consumer ancestry testing, um, a lot of these things Larry mentioned. Um, people raise this as an issue as whether LC should be funding these because really, at the level of resources, you know, there's very, you know, people have a sense that there's very tight money now, and this isn't directly related to medical issues, and so should uh, NHGRI be funding that? The sense of the group was that, in fact, it really should be funding it. They're very important to the public, and in the public's mind, it's the division, the distinction between genetic and non-genetic, or I'm sorry, medical and not medical, is not necessarily the same uh, understanding that we would have. And so if something happens in, uh, I think Larry said, if the FBI gets it wrong, you know, the fallout would, would also come to, to medical uses. So, <coughs> that was a mistake. <coughs> anyway, so the idea was <coughs> these are very important issues and we should continue to support them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> No, I just, I just drank water. That was the problem. <laughs> okay. All right. In the last category, the last. <laughs> the last category we call beyond genomics, and what we mean by that simply is that obviously, with uh, the, all the interest in genomics, there's uh, research that is developing that is getting further and further away from 
human genomics and animal genomics that, that NHGRI is particularly interested in. And so does ELSI, does ELSI follow that, that dispersion of topics or does ELSI limit itself? And um, uh, there have in the past been limitations and the sense was that that was appropriate and they should continue. And once again, the same with the single disease. I think one of the things that was useful about the, uh, the working group meeting for staff was clarifying from the perspective of the community um, why um, or in what way the policy seemed to be confusing to people in the community. All right, so um, the next thing that we tried to work on was um, something that we never actually came up with a good phrase for. So prioritization criteria um, is, is the best we can do here. What this refers to is uh, the idea that, again, because things are during it's a period of change, the division um, has been invented, and so it's a time to reflect on uh, basic issues, boundaries, things like that. And so one of the questions was, <clears throat> what are the underlying or the implicit uh, principles that guide um, LC funding decisions? So this is not priorities. This is not we will fund this as opposed to that, or we would like to see something on patient advocates, it's not topic-centered, it's what are the principles that underlie uh, LC funding. And the idea of this was just to have a conversation. These are principles that are implicit but have not been made explicit. And um, the hope was that um, <clears throat> in making them explicit, it just becomes um, a tool that can be used in planning and evaluating and moving forward <clears throat> with LC programs as they emerge over the next decade. Um, and so these ideas, uh, concepts, um, are not to be used externally. It's not, a, again, it's not a priority for a grant. These are provisional. <clears throat> More work will be done. They're for internal use. Um, so these are the ideas which um, they're very truncated to get them on a slide. <coughs> so if people have questions, I'd be happy to answer. But in thinking about whether um, a very uh, uh, a project that's proposed um, or an issue that's brought up uh, in terms of whether or not it funding it advances these um, or expresses these ideas. So is it consequential? So it pre presents an opportunity for impact. Is it fundamental or basic? Provides the necessary basic data <clears throat> or encourages uh, fundamental normative or conceptual analysis, which the group really highlighted because that is something that's very distinct to the LC program across NIH. It is the only program that has explicit funding for normative and conceptual work. Uh, effective in light of LC resources, which are very um, <clears throat> restricted, is this something that's going to benefit from LC? So is it just, you know, a pebble in a pond, or are we actually going to be able to, to make a difference? Uh, time sensitive, newly emergent, uh, fleeting sense of disappearing opportunity. People were interested in things like, you know, um, Historical projects, for instance, uh, oral history projects that might have to uh, work with a, a population that's aging, scientists or people who've worked in this field, <clears throat> and so there's a disappearing opportunity. Um, inclusive, is this question significant to diverse or understudied communities or groups with health disparities? Now, understand, no one project is meant to fulfill all of these at all. This is just a list of principles that the LC project implicitly already has uh, used or that if you look back at the history of their project, many of the things that they funded and the priorities they have and the topics they pursue express these. So this was uh, a, a <clears throat> an exercise in values clarification. Okay, so. Um, as I said before, the study section that reviews the LCPA is a new one, relatively new. Um, developed in 2011, and if, I don't know whether people are still here from that, but Rudy gave a very lengthy presentation, well, when it was first invented, I know, first developed, I'm not sure if anybody's still here. Anyway, um, so there has been concern about the study section, not, um, I think, any different than um, any particular study section. Communities always have something to say about their study sections. I think the issue that was highlighted in conversation was the effect of the LC community being extremely small and the impact that has on study sections. So what happens very often is you bring people into the study section um, for a certain expertise and then they're out of the room half the day because they're in conflict with the proposals. 
Um, and that increases reliance on SEPs and ad hoc members, which sometimes can be fine, but I think sometimes in the community people are concerned that there's an inconsistency. There's no particular evidence that shows that, but it's a concern that people wanted to talk about. And the other thing to think about is that very often the kind of expertise that is required in an LC review, so history, philosophy, law, are not, are not readily available in the CSR pool. Not that there's literally a single pool, but it's harder for them people in, the, um, in CSR to go out and find them. It's not their natural community. So the suggestion moving forward to try to address that is for um, the LC staff to look into the possibility of being able to provide um, uh, CSR with a uh, list of reviewers with particular expertise to sort of bridge this gap with what, what's the traditional pool of people uh, that are drawn from, uh, from which uh, other study sections draw in contrast to the to the LC study section, or not the LC, the CR study section. Okay, and then um, the last thing we did, which is very related in many ways to the slides that, um, that Larry was showing, is um, we looked at this question of the relationship between the division and the research program. And so he had that one slide that had the circle, and then LC almost filled up the entire circle. So the question is, as the division develops and as it starts to take on that long list of very interesting consultative um, obligations and to fulfill the mandate of the division is to build that even more, um, one of the questions that the working group took on was um, how to um, think about what effect or impact that might have on ELSI and how ELSI should move forward in, in, this, new, in this new picture. So the working group felt that it was an important point, an important moment right now in this transitional phase to confirm, to affirm that there is a distinctive um, role of ELSI within uh, the division, and that is that it should be the research program, and that the ELSI set aside that has been in place, um, I don't know, more than 20 years, um, should go only to funding research, should not be diverted to consultation. Um, so obviously there's a, a mismatch here because you have this exciting growing program, um, uh, but there's a sense on the working group that there really needs to be a commitment to maintaining the research portfolio and the, and the work that goes into that. Uh, and so the suggestion was to add a full-time staff member to the division. So the way it works now, and I could be, I'm not sure I have the details right, is that most of the personnel in the division are, in fact, ELSI personnel. I believe Nicole Lockhart is part-time division, and of course Larry is as well. Um, but the idea would be if you had somebody who was committed to the division who could help organize and take on some of those consultative roles, that they, that uh, work could grow and the um, uh, division could uh, fulfill its mandate overall going forward. Um, What's next? Over the next year, we're going to look more closely at, we've, we did look somewhat at portfolio balance, but we're going to look at that more closely. Uh, we're interested in trying to figure out a training mechanism in particular, because the, the SEER, which has been excellent in terms of training, um, um, does sunset automatically, and there's concern in the community that they lose the, um, uh, the you know, an enormous amount of work goes into the infrastructure and they, they lose the opportunity to, to continue working with that. They can't apply again, which is appropriate in terms of sharing the resources, but that's a question. Then the, another thing we're going to take on is uh, normative conceptual research, uh, because what we think is important, because it is a very distinctive uh, LC contribution, what we think is important is to be able to define and explain what it is and what its particular contribution is. I mean, I think a lot of people, I know it when I see it, but there really, to the best of our knowledge, isn't a clear statement of, of its boundaries and, um, and what it has contributed. And then the question would be, given what it, its boundaries are, given what it's contributed, do we think that there's enough of it within the portfolio? And importantly, do we think that there's something over and above what we're doing now to encourage those kinds of applications? Because those applications very often come from people with no science background, no NIH background, they don't know really how to write a grant, they're very smart, they do very good work, but the grant writing process, which can be a barrier for anybody when they're first starting, is for some of them an enormous barrier that they just don't, they don't, uh, they don't feel like they have 
the knowledge to go forward and given that there seems to be a very look there is a very um, high bar for funding now it's very hard for people to decide that they should go ahead and do that and they should spend the time to try and then we'll go ahead also and look at um, some issues that we've started looking at but I didn't report on here because we're not really done with them and that's outreach to the community and some more issues related to SEER and that's about it um, I do want to take a moment and thank um, the ELSI staff. They have done an enormous amount of work for us. They have answered our questions. They have created um, so many tables and charts. And, you know, I, I know having done a little work like that myself, what sounds like a simple question of, oh, can we just see it this way instead of that way <laughs> can be an enormous amount of work. So um, Joy Boyer and Jean McEwen and Nicole Lockhart, who, who isn't with us, um, I really want to thank because they have really facilitated the work of this committee quite a bit. So, thank you. Any questions? Yes. So, so thank you. Um, it was really informative, and and I um, just will say a couple of disclaimers. So, I used to be the chair of the of the study section before it converted to this um, seer. So I probably can share some insights about that. I mean, in the process, I don't think that um, the issue of having a lot of people in conflict is unique to this particular study section because we all, from what I remember, there were quite a bit of, there was quite a bit of conflict on the previous study section. I think that's just a, a problem that has to be dealt with um, or an issue that has to be dealt with. But I wanted to go back to one of your early slides, um, the one that was yellow. <laughs> okay, let's see. Double rainbow, man. <laughs> you don't like the double rainbow? I, I like this one, the, the, the previous one, the first one, this one. that one okay. there. So I found that really curious, and I wanted to ask you to help me understand it. Is this sort of the how the boundaries have been established previously, or what's recommended as the boundaries moving forward? Okay, so um, the single disease is, uh, th those are all existing boundaries. Okay, the single disease, the non-medical, and the limit to certain things falling beyond genomics. Okay, so we don't fund projects that come in about stem cells, for instance. So these are limitations, some of which were explicitly stated, some of which were not explicitly stated, and importantly, some of which were misunderstandings. So, so, so in other words, I think that the, there, there is no single disease, quote, single disease limit in the LCPA. But okay. the community interpreted some of the language in the LCPA to say they are not acceptable. Okay. I Does mean, that help? That, that is helpful. I mean, I do think it's important to clarify because as I remember, some of the very first LC studies did focus very specifically on a single okay, these, disease. Okay, this is recent. I'm sorry. Okay. So this is so this maybe, is the, there, okay. there was, Jean or Joy might be able to speak to this, but there was new language that went into a PA, I'm going to say 2006 or 7, um, that addressed the issue of generalizability, okay. but that was then interpreted by people as no more single disease. No, so you're right. The beginning of ELSI was much single disease work. Okay. But I, I, guess, I guess I would then just question um, what the implications of that are, given how other programs within a, an HGRI does have a very disease, single disease focus. And mm -hmm. so in some ways I just wonder about creating a limit when that's not the approach that might be used in other um, funding settings. Okay. I, I, maybe I take responsibility for okay. an unclear slide I think is okay. the best way to think about this. Um, Let's have Jean is at a mic and then yeah. Amy and if not clarified then I'll come back in. Yeah, just to sort of clarify. I mean, um, all of these things are things that, you know, it's not as if we've ever had a specific prohibition against funding any of this kind of stuff. These are more issues that have been coming up more recently. For example, as we've begun getting in more and more studies that are focused very narrowly on a, a particular disease that don't have great generalizability, okay, sure. we felt you know, we feel that that's really what other institutes should be funding. And so okay. that's really why this question has come up because it's becoming more of an issue. Got it. And the same thing with the non-medical. We, you know, we have a long history of funding stuff in the forensic and ancestry. We funded and continue to fund a lot of grants in that area, but it's a matter of questions about 
you know, as resources are scarce, you know, should this continue to be a priority or is this something that should be funded somewhere else? Okay. Um, I understand. Okay. Thank you. Amy? Or yeah, so just, um, just building on that, I think a lot of the discussion among the working group was should there be boundaries around this? And I don't think this is dissimilar to conversations we've had at this table about NHGRI in general, which is other institutions should be funding this because it's about their disease, but if they're not funding it, should we fund it because we think it's important? And if we're going to fund it, does that mean they're just going to say, well, they'll fund it anyway, so therefore, <laughs> you know, so it's sort of this tension of like, we think other sh people should be funding it, but if they're not going to fund it, does our funding it mean that it's important or does it mean that they're just going to sort of turf it over to us? So I think that was a lot of the discussion and I don't think, I think there, it was a vigorous discussion. I don't think there was clear consensus and it's a really difficult question. Um, so I think the, the main thing, Pamela, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that I think there was consensus on was that there should at least be clarity yeah. to the community about if there are boundaries, where are those boundaries so that people aren't misinformed about what they can submit and what they can't submit and people getting sort of different information and one person submitting something because they think they can and the other person not submitting that same thing because they think they can't. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Okay, sorry. Yeah, I just had one comment on that with the um, program announcement. What we did recently was we have a new program announcement and it refers to the website and we were able to put a lot more information on the website about the things that we're interested in and, and it's not boundaries but the various examples to make it a lot more clear. The program announcement structure, it's a lot harder to get that in that language that the program announcement has to do. So mm -hmm. we also have the ability to update the website and change the website as we go along. So for those of you who haven't looked in a long time, and it's only been up a couple of weeks now, take a look at the program announcement website. On, on our own website, sorry. You can go from the program announcement to the website, the, NH the NHGRI website. And it's an extensive document, it includes the other institutes that have um, co-funded, that have agreed to co-sign on and have their examples. And I have one closing comment when we're done that I should do that. Amy? Just one more thing on that. I think there was also, I don't see it on here, but I think there was also quite a bit of discussion around sort of um, this movement from LC to genomics and society and sort of more of the health services outcomes type research that's being embedded into some of the other projects and whether that was a positive mood, move in terms of how we're defining LC um, and how broad we should be defining LC. And, um, and I, again, I don't think there was very clear consensus on that, but I think there's a lot of opinions about that within the community on both sides. Yeah? Um, yes. And just to explain why it didn't appear on a slide is because I felt like these issues really were dealt with very, cl in the end, clearly came to consensus, the group came to consensus, whereas with the health services research, they did not come to consensus. We didn't have a specific discussion of it, and so we will have a specific discussion, and that will come up next. So I'll, I'll just state an opinion about that. I remember there, there's a lot of, I mean, Amy, that's a great point. I was, you articulated what I was thinking about very well, so we must be on a mind meld, even at this late hour in the day. Um, but I remember, you know, had discussions at some um, workshop. I can't remember the, the specific context of the workshop, but there was a whole, seemed like a brouhaha about behavioral science and whether or not that was LC research and then having, like, conversations about health services research, whether or not that's health, LC research. I, I think it's all LC research. I don't know that I would make a clear distinction between one or the other, I think that those are all components of the LC research program that are, that's really sort of within the bigger context of genomics and society. And so I guess I just wonder, I, what I do remember about that workshop is that, you know, the, the LC sort of um, acronym is, is known worldwide and to eliminate it would be, um, would have unintended consequences, I think. Um, but, you know, I do think there perhaps is an opportunity to educate all of us about what is LC research and it's a broader mandate than some of the things that people like Howard might think it is. Well, you Howard, raised... what is it that you said this morning that I oh, missed? No, it wasn't this morning. It was a few councils okay. ago. Okay. But, but actually, I think you make a really good point. I, you're relatively new to council, but when I became director and then we went through the, the visioning process for the 2011 strategic plan, 
Um, there was lots of discussion around whether LC was holding us back versus the value of the brand of LC. And if you noticed when we reorganized and we created a division to house LC, I didn't call it the LC division. We called it, we tried to broaden it and make it a little more vague so that with time that mission could grow beyond the exact words represented by ELS and I. And so I, I, I resonate with exactly what you were saying. Um, so wait, I think we had Lucilla and then we'll go Amy. Yeah, along these lines, uh, the set aside just for research, what's important is to define what research is. And I was a little worried um, that if research is not defined in terms of, you know, there are some real problems there, there might not very be very appealing to researchers in ethics, but they are appealing to those on the I part of it, on the implications, how we set up certain um, IRB uh, to be more homogeneous in how they interpret things and so on. Uh, so the whole aspect of implementation science for ethics-related um, uh, rules or policies and so on, is that research or not? Would that be considered according to this? Um. Well, I think that's exactly the, the controversy over health services research. Mm -hmm. So that um, there are certainly people who would agree that this is part of what um, uh, is, because it's needed for genomic medicine, it falls under NHGRI, therefore ELSI. And then I think that there are people who would see ELSI as having a more specific mandate to look at the ethical and legal and social not the implementation, right? I is implications. And that is part of the argument. And I think that so far, um, there are many really excellent projects that are looking essentially at implementation. But the question is, this is a, an important time, I think, to define what that's, what, what, what's the range of projects that fall under health services. And I think some would not be appropriate, and some might be. Right, because I would argue that the I uh, does is imp implications in implementation. Right. Okay. I I. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll say one more thing, then I'll shut up. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, I think there's the other. So I, I think there's two things that I don't know if this is what you were talking about, but there's sort of the health services type research, but then there's also the kind of service type research of, you know, um, many of these large scale projects have people in the field of LC doing work like, um, you know, reviewing consent forms and helping with sort of more of the regulatory aspects of the project and is that research. And I think we also had quite a big debate about whether that should be counted as research and funded through the LC program or not. Um, so I think that's an important point as well. And I just to just, I just wanted to comment on the health services stuff because I also, I, I do some of that research. I think it's important. I think the concerns that we heard around the table um, and in the community were just that, you know, that tends to be very expensive research and that the concern that it would swallow sort of some of the normative and legal and, and you know, some of the really important sort of, we want to call them flagship <laughs> aspects of the LC program. And so I'm not sure it was a matter of should we do it or not do it, but really more of much a, more a matter of balance and how to, and how to allocate resources. I think, I mean, I think the concern was maintaining the identity of what it is that LC funded research can do that other research doesn't. And you do have a AHQR, AHRQ. Thank you. Um, which does health services research. And so the question is whether or not you should really be going to the LC community to do research that they're not really um, capable of doing. So Larry, you said you wanted to have yeah. some closing comments. Yeah, one historical comment is that at least a long time ago, the LC research program also funded educational materials and production and printing. And so one of the strong mandates is to stay in the research realm. Defining research is difficult, but it, we know that printing brochures is not research, and that's not in the mandate any longer. The closing comment was just about this being an open session and being televised. Both Pamela and I mentioned the FBI. I can tell you definitively that the FBI is actually really interested in this, and, and reached out to us and we had a great uh, kind of hallway conversation with an agent about they want to get this right. So I didn't want to leave the impression with anyone watching or the FBI themselves that, <laughs> that, that, that they, I, you notice I didn't mention the other guys, uh, that they weren't thinking about that. The FBI has actually been pretty forward thinking and proactive and contacted our policy people and we're talking to them. And there's an agent outside in the hall who wants to talk to you as soon as you're done. <laughs> Okay. 
All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Pamela. All right. And finally, last but not least, Lise Feingold is going to give us an update on the ENCODE project.